everyone to the 2017 Distinguished Faculty Award. This is the first year that it's actually been called the Leonard Degrassi Distinguished Faculty Award for the storied instructor who first received it and um, whose name we, we want to keep in memory now. Uh, I'm going to introduce last year's recipient, who is Darren Lever. He's a professor, full-time professor of geography here, has been for 22 years, and many of us know him even more significantly as the organizer and intrepid explorer who heads up uh, our study abroad program, and he's been doing that for 17 years. He's been traveling the entirety of his life. You know, his parents left him on a doorstep and he found his way back to them. They were so wise. So he's visited 75 countries. Last year he gave us a wonderful talk about where to travel when, according to climate and season, and this year he's going to introduce our our recipient for 2017. So, Darren, please. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Those just coming in, please, you can take a seat. All right. Now we know uh, a little bit about the award, but basically the Leonard Degrassi Distinguished Faculty Award can be given to a full-time faculty member who's been at GCC for at least 10 years. It shall be given primarily for distinguished contributions in the recipient's discipline, but beyond that, to the entire campus, or service to the entire campus. And I think our 2017 awardee, Paul Bear, is an exceptional choice for this exceptional award. So uh, Paul has been an outstanding full-time faculty member in the credit ESL division since the year 2000. He's innovative. What people say about you, Paul? Innovative. I love it. Thank you. And he's been innovating here for the entire 17 years. Not only does he use innovation in his classes, he's also created materials like open educational resources to reduce the, the textbook costs for his students. He's coordinated the ESL Division's high school outreach program and educated not only students, but also his colleagues by mentoring our new ESL fac uh, faculty members. Paul brings his diverse skill set to the campus workplace. In addition to his degrees in ESL, he has a degree, he has an MA in mediation. His mediation skills are put to the test all the time as he's currently in his third term as the Guild Grievance Officer. He brings together the various factions, encouraging them to listen to each other and to respect one another. And he's highly respected by both sides. He's got a sense of humility and is, he genuinely listens to others. Uh, Paul has shared some of his uh, personal details uh, over the last couple of weeks. I wanted, he wants me to share some of those. Uh, Paul is an avid fisherman. He's gone fishing over a dozen times in the past 10 years. He hasn't caught a single fish. <laughs> oh. guy. Paul, Paul and his wife, Letty, they met on Match.com. Fortunately, Paul set the search radius at 25 miles, <laughs> which allowed him to meet the love of his life and his soulmate. Unfortunately, he now has a 22-mile commute every morning from West LA. <laughs> Paul once wrote a check for 10,000 bucks for the monthly rent on a one-bedroom apartment. Ever since then, Letty has dealt with all household finances. <laughs> <laughs> Over the past 17 years, Paul has distinguished himself in the classroom and across the campus. He's well respected by the GCC students, faculty, staff, and administrators alike. He's highly committed to his students. He has extraordinary student evaluations. The students love him. There have been very few, if, if none, probably, any student complaints ever. He has a long line of students outside of his office, and he stays there beyond his office hours to make sure that every single student has time to have their questions answered. And this is something that I think it really emboldens the spirit of GCC instructors and the faculty across the board. Paul Vera exemplifies excellence in teaching at GCC, and for this reason, he is a recipient of the 2017 Leonard Degrassi Distinguished Faculty Award. Congratulations. <laughs> Yeah. This is real. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I have to go back to this. Okay. You wanna should put this down there? Yeah, thanks.
Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody. By the way, if you need flex, here's the flex form. <laughs> Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. I'm proud and humbled to be here, everyone. Um, it's funny. Yesterday, I, 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 my five-year-old son, Diego, asked me for more, for more ketchup, and I went and got milk, and then I, I, I missed the off-ramp to my, to my house, and then I, I, I bought some coleslaw dressing, and I put it on the top of my car, and I <laughs> dropped it, and it cracked the window, and, 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 I, and I thought to myself, I realized like, this is like a typical day for me. So <laughs> it's just nothing to do, you know. So if you, if you uh, any nerves today or any emotion, it's really because the Dodgers are in the playoffs. <laughs> Dodgers. Yes, Dodgers. yes, the Dodgers. Anyways, uh, so I should really, you know, I talk, talk about mistakes a lot, my own, my students. I probably should have called this um, lecture Mistakes in Me or Mistakes in Us or something like that. Uh, because, you know, uh, you know, I make mistakes too. My students mistakes, make, take mistakes too. Um, I'm excited to be here. Uh, for almost 16 years now, well, 17 years, I've been at Glendale College and I've been teaching for 25 years. And really, who I am now, what I do now, is really the sum total of all those experiences and all the people that have worked with me, uh, students and colleagues. Um, you know, when I first started out in 1992, uh, you know, I couldn't do a lot of things like explain on why is it on the other hand instead of in the other hand, right? Or stuff like, um, uh, you know, if a student doesn't understand a piece of grammar, that I can always sing it to them. I said, I asked a um, uh, student, do you have kids? They go, yes. I go and say, let it to go, let it to go. <laughs> you can hear the, the incorrect usage of the word. Or a famous quotes, to be or to not be. <laughs> right? You can just, it just picks up, students can hear it, okay? Also, like, you know, if I could explain vocabulary. So my, my syllabus clearly states that uh, I gotta read my syllabus. It actually says no consumer electronic devices with internet access are allowed during class time, which means students say, "Well, what what is a consumer electronic device with internet access?" Well, it's cell phone, that's uh, laptop, that's tablet, but that also means you could bring in a washing machine or a microwave <laughs> to class anytime you want. Okay, so I started. A, I I started. Um, you know, back in 1993, and I th remember my first job interview. I, I um, you know, I never taught before, right? And I went to this school over in Bell Gardens. Uh, I think it was United Education Institute or something like that. And I was I interviewed for a job that met like that met uh, Saturdays and Sundays, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. And these were long, big classes, 40, 50 students. And so I interviewed for the job, and the guy goes, uh, "It's funny, the guy looked like Rick Perez, but <laughs> but not no, but I, I love Rick Perez. I'm not saying." But, but he looked like Rick Perez. Anyway, anyways, but anyways, um, maybe it was Rick Perez. No, no, no. Anyways, he said, here's the job, right? And well, no, first he said, hey, um, you, can you show me some teaching? And I go, you know, I'm like, yeah, all right. And so, see, I got a classroom right over here at 30 students. Let's go. I'm like, yeah, all right. And I'm walking like, you know, uh. so I, I get in the class and like, you know, these very, very patient students are sitting there, you know, really nice group of people and, and you know there's a nice there's always by the way in ESL class there's always a nice older woman in the front that's just kind of <laughs> smiling you know and there was one there was one there okay and there's always been one there since 1993 we we need you ESL professors need you um, every class needs one uh, it doesn't have to be a woman that's not to be nice well, anyways anyways so she had this nice like kind of pleasant look on her face so I'm, I'm I'm fumbling through the lesson and she's just looking at me like, <laughs> shaking her head, just, yeah, you really suck. <laughs> but, but you know, at the same time, I'm, I, at 1993, getting my TESOL degree at, at, um, at uh, Cal State LA, um, one of my professors, I can't remember his, na uh, his name, it was a man, but he told me that one of the best ESL lessons he ever saw was from the uh, 1990, uh, sorry, 1987 film, Born in East LA. So I don't know if any of you have seen this film. I'm sure if you live in LA, you grew up in LA, you've seen it. If you're Latino, you've definitely seen it. Or sorry, uh, from Mexico, you've definitely seen it. Or Mexican origin. But I'm gonna show you a clip from that lesson. The lesson's actually pretty long, but I'm gonna see about a minute and a half of it. And I'll give you, here's the setup. 
So Rudy, uh, played by Cheech Marin, is uh, deported, okay, accidentally, mistakenly. And um, he's got to get back to the United States. Okay? He's got to make enough money to pay a coyote, which is a smuggler, to get him across the border so he can get back to LA. Um, so he has to work all these odd jobs. Okay? So one of the jobs he takes on is to teach this group, these group of immigrants, these migrant workers who have jobs in the United States, how to blend in. Okay? <laughs> so this, this is the clip. Let me see. Let me see. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, good. Uh, you want to say something? Okay. So, like, say you see a guy walking down the street. You want to say hi. You go. Hola, levato. What's happening? Hola, levato. What's happening? Hold on. Check this out. All right. Oh, okay, watch this. Here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> What's happening? Oh, 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 What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? you got it. I think that shows a lot of things about, I mean, I'm not, I, don't, I don't teach what's happening in my, in my classes, <laughs> but I don't know how to help them take a biology, you know, take a biology class. But um, I mean, if we look at basically what, what Rudy's doing right there, it's, it's basically he adapts, okay? So we do that a lot in the classroom. We, you, you, you try to find out what the, what the student wants, right? What the student, the, the goal, what the student's like, 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 I, like for example, I had a, I had a, um, a guy, vice president of Otis Elevators, when I, when I worked in Moscow, uh, vice president of Otis Elevators in the region, and he needed to give this big presentation in, in Germany. And so we spent weeks just going over his presentation, right? And so we talked about standing up and hand gestures and really, really rhetoric. Uh, another one, like for example, I remember being uh, teaching a class of uh, five-year-olds in Moscow, and we're going, Head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes, right? So I mean, you really you have to think about what what is the what are the students' needs before you even plan the lesson. It's not it's not as top down as maybe uh, not very top down. Use the resources available. Um, you know, Rudy just grabs a piece of chalk and starts writing on a wall. You know, um, you know, if I go in my classroom and the overhead's not working, I don't care. You know, I'll just start teaching, right? Or if, you know. If I don't have any markers, I don't care. You know, I'll take out a pair of keys. You know, just start. You know, that becomes it. You know, that be I illustrate thing. I mean, if I don't have a pair of keys, then I start using my. You know, anyways, we just use whatever we got in, on, around us. Um, communicates in different ways. So, you like, you know, there's a lot of hand gestures, a lot of eye contact. There's a lot of motion. There's a lot. You know, there's anything to get that student to to get it to get to that that. Uh, Eureka moment, and you never give up. I mean, you just keep at it. You just, you, you try this way, you try that way, you write it down, you try it backwards, you, and you say, come see me in my office afterwards. They still don't get it, you know, send me an email, you know. S come see me again, you know, you just, you just, and that's really what we do a lot in our job. I just, I just want, I just want you to use the verb tense correctly. <laughs> somewhere, some way. So, um, so what, what the hell is this, right? This is, this is on my title, right? Okay, you're like, Ooh. yeah. Yeah, it's a language from, uh, no, I'm just kidding. It's, it's, it's the phonetic alphabet. So any, anybody that teaches ESL or has any kind of linguistics background has learned, maybe I didn't memorize, memorize some of this, but uh, you have to be able to describe the sounds that any language makes. And that's what this is doing. 
So if you take an ESL 125, ESL 135 class here, they learn a little bit of this, especially the vowel sounds, because there are a lot of sounds in English that are used or not used um, in their language, okay? And so, but here's the thing, what the point I'm trying to make is that we don't teach the science of language. We want to teach how to use a language. So, let me show you how I'm going to teach you how to say this, okay? All right, so, the way we teach uh, pronunciation is this. You could do this with little kids too, it works. You don't start from the beginning. You start from the end, okay, and you add on. It's called back chaining. For some reason the brain seems to respond better and sort of get uh, under, and able to connect all the different sounds. There's a little vodka. There you go. <laughs> Ooh, just a little bit. Yeah. Anyways, so, uh, okay, so, I want everybody to start with this sound, all right? And you're going to do it, okay? Now, yeah, just go, mm. 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 I mean, real, put it there right in the nose. I mean, this is really American. I mean, when I, when I lived in Moscow, I could stand on one end of red square, and the other end of red square, I can hear, mm, 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 over there. Those are the people, probably from Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, it's more, it's more nasally. Yeah. Anyway, okay, that sound is i. E, 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 get it? So when you go e, mm, it becomes ing. E, okay? That's a real tight, tight sound. Mm. Then you go ing. E. Okay, now get really lazy, okay? This is what's called the schwa. Don't, don't, I mean, I mean like don't put, put like zero energy into it. Just go. Uh. This is the, this is the sound of English when we pause. So if I'm speaking and I go uh, uh. Uh, other languages go e, e, e. Spanish goes eh, eh, eh when they pause. English goes uh. So everybody, everybody go uning. 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 Very good. You push on the N, stop there. Now, say P, but don't push it out like a, don't aspirate it basically. Don't go P, go P. But not B, go B, P. Like, yeah, anyways. <laughs> now, so you go, baning, baning, okay? Now this one is, is a very English sound, ah, <laughs> okay? So now you go, happening, <laughs> okay? Now this S right here with these two little dots right, it looks like a colon, okay? That means you're going to extend it, so, sapping, okay, good. Now this sound is, is, um, is, is, uh, I was gonna say it's more East Coast, but uh, no, they go more oh, oh. Like, okay, anyways. Uh, so this is, uh, so you have an, another uh, extension right there, so it goes, ah, sapaning. Ah, sapaning. And you know what this sound is? All together it becomes, wa, sapaning. Okay, now everybody, everybody lean, everybody stand up, lean back, and go, orale, vato, wa, sapaning. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. All right, so. I'll see you on the corner of uh, Soto and Cesar Chavez um, this weekend. All right, so what kind of languages do I encounter at GCC? And I'm proud to say that I've seen these and I would say many, 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 many others, okay? Uh, I, I, you know, uh, like I see Richard Seltzer real early in the morning when he was here. Yeah, you. And, and, and he's still there. Well, in, in his office when he was there. And he's retired now. And at least Lee in the morning, we, 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 we we, we get so excited when a new language shows up in the classroom, right? Not that we, we don't love, you know, you know, whoops, I went back this way. Um, not that we, you know, we love these more main languages, more mainstream languages we hear at DCC, but like, I was really happy to, to this semester that, wow, I got a Kurdish speaker. Like, who speaks Kurdish? Like, like most of you are like, where is, the, where is that? And, 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 or, or, you know, Serbo-Croat or Bantu or Laotian, um, Bengali, Hindi. I mean, these are all, I mean, this, what, what I like to, th I feel very fortunate that, that what I do here is really sort of a, a snapshot of really what the world is. And just a reminder that really most of us are from somewhere else. Um, what I do, okay, this is what I do. I teach college writing to ESL students. We do uh, essays. Uh, paragraphs, test answers, summaries, and may also um, students learn to find and correct errors in their writing, okay? 
but it's not always easy, okay? And I'll tell you, um, it's a labor of love. I'm not saying that the student is, is a problem, not at all. That part I can do with. It's, it's, it's like the outside stuff, okay? So it's like, um, I'll give you an example. So um, I'm at Fat Burger, okay? And I'm getting a hamburger. And I, I clearly tell the, 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 the guy working there, no relish on the hamburger, right? <laughs> Come back later, I get into it, and I'm like, you know, I go to this place all the time, and I bite in the hamburger, and there's relish. I can just feel it all over my mouth. <laughs> Soaked in the bun. I mean, relish is disgusting, okay? <laughs> it, I, mean, I, I'm, I mean, I'm cool with a dill pickle, right? Like a, a slight, a spear, but not relish. It's sweet. I mean, okay, when I go to a Dodger game with my wife, okay, she wants relish on her hot dog. I will commit that disgusting act out of a, uh, that's an act of love, okay, <laughs> to do that, to actually turn that thing and it just, any, um, or, or for example, another thing that pisses me off, right, is, is, is well, no, it kind of pisses me off, but I mean, I'm driving, you know, I do a lot of freeway driving, right, so I'm coming like north on the 10, Right? And I'm, you know, I'm sitting there, I'm listening to you know, some Pet Shop Boys and Western Town, Ben and Wolf, you know? And all of a sudden, this Beamer with a USC sticker cuts me off. <laughs> now, some, this is being televised, and there's some guy with a USC bathrobe going, click, and shut me off. That's cool. Go, go UCLA. Okay. Uh, so the, it's that frustration, okay? And I, I think. I'm joking, but I think some of you also feel that frustration with an ESL student that makes mistakes. It's hard to read student writing when there are errors, okay? Uh, and if it's difficult for me sometimes to deal with, um, maybe it's difficult for you. And so when you come upon writing that looks something like this, I'll read it to you. Since 1930s, Los Angeles County with US Army Corps of Engineers created the flood control project because of Los Angeles River Shores is honored by thick layer of concrete and became a flood control and was separated at people by the fence. Okay? Now I've had this sentence for 10 years. I used to pull a lot of student work and use it as examples and get the permission and use it. And so I've been reading this for years. I still don't know what this student is, was trying to say. Okay? Now here, here's the funny thing is that if you teach civil engineering or if you teach urban planning or something, you kind of get it, right? You just go like, oh, okay, yeah, 30s, shores, concrete, separated. Yeah, I kind of get it. But, you know, if you sit there and you try to understand it, it's really frustrating, okay? And you don't know what to do. You know, you might sort of feel like this guy. Right? And, and, or even worse, maybe kind of feel like this guy. <laughs> You know, and, and the thing is, I, I, and the thing, and it, I have to say that, that my, my, my teaching grammar, okay, it is really, it's not just verbs and, 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 and paragraphs and stuff, is I'm always thinking about that reaction to my student writing. Like, I don't want a student giving the wrong impression. I don't want a biology professor, not that you would, but I don't want a biology professor, a sociology professor, a health professor going like, I don't understand what you're saying. I just don't get it. And so, because that leads to all kinds of things. Uh, I don't, who knows. Um, so helping to prevent some frustration. Uh, frustration. So for me, on, on some level, ESL students always make some kind of error throughout their lives. And I tell students this all the time. You're going to make errors. Like unless you can spend eight hours a day for the next seven years studying grammar and reading, and then you might become a little bit more, less, I hear fewer errors. Um, so the goal of writing is not so much to be perfect or to be correct, it's to be clear, okay? And I found that with my students, if I'm focused on being more clear, the other stuff kind of just falls into place. Not always, and not always perfectly. You need, um, the studies have shown, and we talk about this all the time uh, amongst ESL instructors, is that you need seven years to go from around zero to be basically a proficient user of academic writing. Nobody has seven years. We attempt to, we attempt to accomplish that on our credit, CL, credit ESL division in five semesters, okay? With breaks, 
okay, with summers off, you know, and winters off. And it just, it, not every student gets there. Not every student is proficient. Uh, not every student has the time to spend on grammar. Not, you know, I want them to. Uh, so I want the goal in writing to be clear so that the non-ESL professor, that's mainly a lot of you guys, never distracted by errors, can determine whether the ESL student understands the material and give the student a good grade. That's my goal, okay? We talk about that kind of stuff. So it's not to blend into East LA, it's to get a good grade. Okay, so my, so I, you know, I, I, I went over this presentation with, with Brett McKenna on Tuesday, that was awesome. Um, and, you know, I had a lot of rules, right? Uh, rule one, rule two, grammar this, grammar that, and the slides had a lot of text. And I really pared this down to the main core for me, uh, what I think I want students to know. And I think for me, and again, the thing about a teaching learning grammar is you can really say anything because grammar is descriptive. It's not, nobody's making the rules. I mean, I was, I, I didn't start using the language and then everybody used it after me. I was kind of born into it. You know, I just work here, right? <laughs> um, language is also changing, okay? La you know, people, uh, the rules that we use now in grammar and punctuation are very different than 50 years ago. You know, in the 50s, you know, little kid comes up and says, you know, can I go to the bathroom? And the mother says, I don't know, can you? <laughs> you know, it's like, I can right now. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so, you know, those kinds of things, we just don't, we just don't have those kinds of rules anymore. Um, the other thing, too, is, you know, babies don't learn grammar. I mean, my son, I don't go up and go, okay, conjugate the verb to be. I am. Um, is our. Uh, is it, oh, no, that's incorrect. Not he is. You know, it's, I mean, yes, excuse me, I messed up. You know, it's, he is. Uh, anyways, so the two rules I would say, and these, these are just, there's lots of others I could talk about, but I want to make it pretty simple for you today. Uh, rule number one, grammar, English grammar often marks twice. And rule number two, English moves left to right, okay? Okay, so English grammar often marks twice. Oftentimes, English is redundant, okay? We don't just, we don't, we don't just tell people things. We tell people things twice. And what I mean by that is, th is this. Um, John has many dogs, okay? So if I go up here and I look at many dogs, right? I, I'm not just telling you many dogs. I'm telling you many dogs twice. And let me show you. I'm, if, I put, if I don't put an S right there, that's a grammar error. And for some reason, that is an error in our language, OK? It might not distract you from meaning, but it's an error. Same happens if you put a right here with the word many and then dog. So this one agrees with that one. This marked twice. But this one doesn't agree with that one or that one. So that this student, when the student makes an error, they're actually marking it twice. Um, now, it's not, it's not that, uh, I think, oh, no one, yeah. So same with things like John has a dog. That might not contextually not make a lot of sense. That one either the dog. But you kind of feel, it feels right. If I take that <laughs> the out of there, or the uh, you're like, where are you from? Like, when people make mistakes, you know, English listeners, uh, like, any, like any culture, make judgments on what you're saying. And so, um, and the thing is, one or two of these is not a problem. It's a lot of these and a lot of other errors that compounds and frustrates you, and maybe prevents you from understanding, okay? But other languages do it too, okay? They mark twice. So for example, uh, Mandarin and Vietnamese are tonal languages. And uh, one of the examples we always use to describe tonal languages is the four tones of of uh, Mandarin Chinese, and that is ma, 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 ma. Okay, so each of those mean three different things. Okay, I can't just I can't walk into a, a, a you know a bar in, in Beijing and go hey ma you know it just doesn't make because I might be saying uh, horse, num, mother, or scold. Okay, so I don't want to bend you, hey, I'd like to introduce to my horse. Okay? <laughs> Russian does the same thing. Russian has case grammar. They have what are called declensions. So it's not just a table. It's not just a stole. It's a stalyu or a stalier or a stalyem or a stalya. And if there are many tables, 
it's stal I can't, I can't remember, Stalyov, Stalya, Stalyami, you know, depending on where the table is. Are you on the table? Are you going through the table? Is the table walking? You know, <laughs> is it with the table? You know, so th those kinds of things can get really, you know, those kinds of markers are done there too. Um, and if you go to Vietnamese, they don't have four tones, they have 12, they, they have 12 vowel sounds with six, tone, six tones, which means it's 72 different distinct sounds they're making, right? You can see the complexity of learning that system, right? And by the way, Finnish, this has six cases. This has 15 cases. So it's not just a, it's not, I don't even know how to say it, but it's not just a table. It's a tableu, tabele, tabala, and then plural on top of that, right? So there might be another 15 on top of that. Anyways, language is complex. Um, and so if you look at this same sentence I just showed you earlier, it's the agreement is what's happening is when we hear this word since, right, it sets us up for this verb tense to agree with that, that uh, time. So if I don't say to you since last night I am tired or since last night I was tired, you have to say since last night I have been tired. And you don't have to really study grammar to know that. As a native speaker, you just kind of learn that and it just sounds right. But for a uh, non-native speaker, there's no agreeing going on there. Same here. When we see that word S, right, we expect right here to be R, not is. So two S's like that shores is or uh, dogs is or people is, it just sounds weird. And when it's set up down here, these are also singular. It's not agreeing with the subject. Okay. Um, students often make errors because they are um, translating their own language, okay? And so if we look at some of these errors, while I'm living in New York, I made a lot of friends. So right here, there's no verb, I am living, okay? This is a typical Russian mistake because Russians don't have the simple present of be in their language. So they're literally, literally saying, I living. If we look at uh, this one right here, although I live in a small apartment, but I am very comfortable. Why am I standing here? <laughs> what happens is there's something in the, in the language, I think this is uh, Farsi does this, and I think Japanese does too, where they sort of connect right here, they make this statement, and then they have to connect again. So this sort of marking twice, uh, which is actually uh, contradicts the error that I'm actually, the rule that I'm just saying right now. But, don't sh <laughs> okay, yesterday I eat, I eat fish for dinner, so yesterday that should be eight. That, those two don't agree. It's not being marked twice. And that might be some, like a language like uh, uh, Mandarin Chinese, which doesn't have verb tenses. Like, why do I have to tell you eight when it's very clearly that I did it already yesterday? Okay, okay so errors can be the, sometimes the simple misuse of a phrase, okay? And this is a very common one we work a lot on in ESL 141. So, the internet has a lot of information so that children like to use computers. Okay? So if you read that left to right, you're just like, you're sort of led to that. So I'll do the left to right in a minute, but you're just kind of like, internet has a lot to read so that, and then you kind of go down this weird path of like to use computers, you get confused. But what the student's trying to say is the internet has a lot of information, so children like to use computers. Does that make better sense? Yeah, that's a cause-result structure. This is an expression of purpose. So, I mean, there are, I think, six different ways to use so in our language, and, you know, in class, we only learn basically three of them. Um, now, what some students do is they put two structures together. They'll just, they'll get like, they'll go for like a two-for-one deal. So, so, you have, according to Ellen Marston's in a laptop for every kid, comma, argues that students should give a free lap to every student. See that? And what they're doing is they are taking that structure according to this person, this statement, and also adding this person, in the, this person argues that. You see that? So a lot of times what this is is a student has learned two structures, and so the student can't distinguish between the two. Second rule, English moves left to right. This sounds like a simple idea, but it's not. And I'll explain you why. Um, 
our world is oriented by the direction our language goes, okay? So, if I were to ask you, where is the past? Okay, you basically look which way? Left, okay? A lot of languages are left to right, okay? And some of the languages that go left to right are English, Armenian, Russian, Spanish, and Cantonese in, Han in Hong Kong. Because they speak English there, they want thing ordered left to right. Languages go uh, right to left are Farsi, Persian, and Arabic. And then you have languages like these, Japanese, Korean, and Mandarin, that could go right, left, left, right, or top down. Okay? <laughs> and the reason they're so flexible is because those languages don't use letters, they use ideographs. And so they're symbols. Like I could, you could put symbols in any kind of order, and everybody kind of knows that you just follow the symbols in the order you're supposed to read it, and I, get, I assume that for them it has specific meaning. So if we look at some examples of this, this is a, a, an essay written in Armenian, uh, you know, you just, it's beautiful to look at. I mean, so, you, but you're basically going left, right, okay? You look at an, uh, an essay written in Chinese, it's also, this one I've been told is left, right. You can see they're putting squares there to make sure that the students put in the symbols. And so this is what I'm talking about, ideographs. I mean, so these, these symbols right here, it's not like you put one line, you put one line and that's boy, and you put another line and that's man, you put another line that's like old man. It's like each, each symbol needs to be memorized. And thousands, you know, tens of thousands of these kinds of characters that, that uh, Chinese could potentially memorize. Uh, Farsi, okay, again, I've been told that this is, a, one student said it was written by a, Nine-year-old, another student told me it was like a five-year-old. So, though they told me it's a lot of repetition. Okay, it's a little kid. Uh, so it's basically right to left, okay, that way. Okay. By the way, those same students told me that most people in Iran don't do any essay writing after grade school. Okay, so if you're going into journalism, you're definitely writing essays. But if you're going to engineering or any, you know, any other kind of degree, you're just not writing essays. So you might have students in your classes that have PhDs in, in, in electrical engineering, but they've never written an essay. They, or they haven't written an essay since they were kids. And so asking them to write an essay in class, it's like, why are you making me do kid stuff? You know? No, it's not kid stuff. It'll, it gets more, you know. Okay, so here's a comic book. I, I love comic books. Uh, this is a great, great, uh, well, it's a graphic novel called Saga. And the reason I show this to you is because when you read comic books, um, there, there's sort of a, there's an organization. You basically go, you read this panel first, this panel first, this, this side of the panel first, the dialogue moves that way. She's even faced that way to, to direct you to, to go in that direction. Um, she starts speaking first. She always starts speaking first because she's on the left, okay? And even if you have uh, something more experimental like Ellen Moore's Swamp Thing, it, it's much more, a little more difficult to follow this, but that's kind of the art of it that you get a little bit lost. So again, we have text that is colored that kind of guide you over to the right, and then you have some, a, an off, a, a different color right here which kind of breaks this in half, which makes you to guide you down kind of this way and then you have to jump back up and you can see how the lightning just shoots down. Let me see. You see how it works? So this kind of orientation left to right is something ingrained in our language. If you go to Japanese manga, okay, Japanese manga is um, uh, right to left. So the comic book opens out like that and you don't go that way, you go that way. So this is actually showing you which direction to go. You basically read it like that. There's dialogue. By the way, this has been translated. You read the dialogue this way. That way, come on down, go back up, back down. Basically, it's just the opposite direction, okay? And there are whole websites dedicated to teaching you how to read these kind of comic books, uh, which are great. They have a long tradition of, 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 uh, of uh, graphic storytelling, okay? So, English, what comes first? And it, it took me a while to find a picture of Batman looking that way, okay? Because he's usually, he's always looking that way, so. It's, on, it's that way, okay? So. The past and the first are on the left. This is what I get to. So, this is the idea. When we teach uh, verb tenses, 
We like to put the uh, ideas on a line, and there's always an arrow right there. See how it's that? Because it's telling our students left to right, okay? And what we're telling the student is that anytime you put two ideas like that, I ate breakfast, period, I went to school, period, the assumption from the reader is that that happened first, that happened second, because it's sequence, okay? So even if you don't assist the reader in understanding the order, you can pretty much, you can pretty much assume that that's the, that's the order they want to go in. The way we assist is we add little, little phrases and things to kind of push us over it, and then gets us to the next idea, or then, or after that, which tells us after that, that being a breakfast, or we, we can introduce it on this side, and when the, when the reader sees us, they know, uh-oh, there's something that's going to happen after that. So what happens, um, that's basically, what I'm, I'll repeat it again, students would, uh, make mistakes because they're not putting time markers like yesterday in 2012 or three years later. They're actually placing them in the wrong place or they're not putting them at all, okay? And also sequence, then, next, after that. So if you, get, if you take a sentence like this, it says, after I graduated in 2003, I found a job, got married, and had a baby in 2007, right? <laughs> so what happens here is you're not quite sure. Did, like, okay, so I assume that the student wanted to correct something like this, so they need to add more information like, when did that action happen? When did that action happen? Or when did that action happen? Because this one looks, it makes it seem like everything, this happened in 2003, and all this happened in 2007. Another error is, would be something like this. Some people get a job, and they lose the job because they do not follow their boss's rules, but they do not know the reason a few days later. So I don't, I don't, I don't know if, the re if they lost the job a few days later, or they didn't know the reason a few days later, okay? And so they're not, the, the reader's not, the writer's not assisting the reader in understanding what they want to say, just, be, just simply because the whole left to right idea, okay? If you put it right here, then the reader knows, okay, that person, that thing happens, and then a few days later, all this stuff happens. Okay, this also happens with pronouns and reference, okay? Not teaching you grammar, but. Um, so we have things like they, okay? So Maria arrived home yesterday with their baby. They are doing well. We know it's Maria and the baby. Maria arrived home yesterday with her baby. She is doing well. Are we talking about Maria or the baby? If you know it's a boy, then it's clear that it's the mother. But if you look at things like this, like I, uh, I arrived at home at 2 a.m., the word this refers to the whole phrase I arrived at 2 a.m., just like which can also refer to that whole sentence. Errors are basically, Maria arrived home yesterday with her sister, he are doing well. Okay? <laughs> so a lot of students will do this because some languages don't have he, she, and it, they only have it. So it doesn't, like, there's no distinguishing, there's no uh, feminine or masculine pronoun. And so if you, you see one of these, you're like, uh, who, you know, who are we talking about here? And this one here, yesterday I talked to Maria and John, who was pregnant, okay? <laughs> you know. So that, is John pregnant? Well, scientifically not yet, you know. Uh, so, ESL students, be mindful of this. Uh, mark grammar twice, and look left to right. Um, by the way, I forgot to tell you about this orient, this, um, this, uh, this idea of left to right. And it's, it, it really didn't hit me till, um, okay, so when I worked in Moscow, I used to, uh, my, the last two years in Moscow, I used to manage a school, okay? And every month, I had to walk two blocks to an ATM or, a, or, the, or inside the bank and take out $15,000 cash and walk it back to the school and pay all my teachers. Okay, so you can imagine I'm pretty, pretty nervous about this, right? Walking around with $15,000 of cash. Anyways, so one day I got to a bank, right? And I got to the bank I always go to, and there was a sign on the bank that basically said, you know, here's the bank, and if I draw myself, I would say, okay, here, here's, here's me right there, you know, just kind of standing in front of the bank. And so I read this sign, 
And so I say to myself, all right, you know, there's this Ulitze, this Periolog, Ulitze. And I go, I, I, I kind of memorize all this stuff, right? We didn't have cell phones back then and take a picture. And so I look at it and go, all right. So I walk this way, I walk this way, right? I walk this way, and I walk that way, right? And like, I, what, we're up, you know, none of the signs, you know, my Russian isn't that bad, right? Well, it turns out that the sign wasn't telling me to go that way. The sign's basically saying, go that way. Or how should I, how do I say it? This, this, is, this orientation is not that. For that person, or maybe for Russians, it's that. Right? So once I realized that, um, it, it really hit me that, you know, um, people see the world very, very differently. So what can professors do for the ESL students? Um, give all students samples of the kind of written work you want to see. That's a, I mean, you, hopefully you're doing that already. But if you say, I want a five, a five I want a five-page paper, give them an example of a five-page paper. It really helps students uh, to know where they need to go. Uh, if, if, if you were, let's, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's minus two <laughs> in my class. It's minus two. And if it happens again, if it happens again it's minus five. <laughs> it's not going to happen again. If your student uh-oh, minus two again. <laughs> this is an idea I came up with, uh, like, I think just before I got here. I think what I was trying to, I think what I'm trying to say here is that um, if you're getting frustrated with it when an ESL student's writing, put it down, okay? Just put it down and grade some other students and then come back to it. Okay, it's real. It's a real simple thing. It's like conflict, everybody. If you're if you're getting mad at somebody, just kind of walk away from a little bit, simmer down, then come back and deal with it. Don't send that email out at 1 a.m. Uh, okay. Anyways, uh, another thing is be mindful of what it takes to learn uh, and write in a second language in an academic setting. I mean, it's a lot of work, and some students never really improve. Um, you know, our students. Uh, like all students, I'm not, not trying to make excuses because I would, I would also add to remind you that never compromise your standards. I mean, your students want, the, want you to use the best standards because these ES students will also want to be the best. Okay? Uh, I just got a couple more things in closing. Um, I'm going to show you the, my, the, my most favorite email I've ever received from a student. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay? I mean, we, we laugh at these things, and, and in the wise words, of, wise words of Steve Marsden, take your work seriously, but don't take yourself seriously, okay? And the student, what's the student doing there? Basically, making an abbreviation of the word assignment, okay? But, you know, students, students are really trying their best to really get the message across. Okay. One last thing before I go. Um, when I lived in Moscow, um, there's a, there was a great marketplace called Ismailovsky Park. And um, it, it's just a, a treasure trove of anything Russian. I mean, you could buy Russian uniforms, Russian cameras, Russian propaganda posters, movie posters. There's a lot of great stuff here. I was there like every other weekend just looking at stuff. When I had money, I would just buy it. Stamps, coins. I mean, just great, great stuff. And um, there it is in the winter. And um, anyways, uh, in the corner was the, was the rug market, like the group of, of uh, Dagest, uh, a group of rug makers from Dagestan, which is a small province in southern Russia, right on the border, right against the Caucasus Mountains. Okay? Now the people in Dagestan are Muslim. Okay? And what the rug makers do is, and, and by the way, we used to, uh, my friend and I, I, my Russian was never that good, uh, but he, he would translate what they were saying. We'd maybe have some tea with these guys. And they explained basically what, what, what they're doing when they make the rugs. And what they're doing is they're trying to make the rug as symmetrical as possible. Okay? And if you look at this right here, and if you, if you spend a few minutes, you could see that the shapes are basically, it's symmetrical, right? But it's not. Okay? There's always some kind of flaw in a rug. Okay? And the beauty of this rug is like going with the symmetry 
and, and finding, like spending time looking in here, where's the flaw? Because good run makers, what they'll do is, they'll just put a little spot here or something. And the reason is that only Allah is perfect. Okay, that people are not perfect. And that for me, that's a powerful message that we are the sum total of our mistakes. We do make mistakes. And so we just keep trying, right? We just keep going at it. Um, so uh, that's it, everybody. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's all I want to say today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me just thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You mind if I thank some people? I want to thank all of my students since 1993. <laughs> all of them. I, I, they, I learned so much from my students. This, this, I'm so blessed to be in this field. Uh, my credit is the Division colleagues. These people, whoops, they have really shaped who I am and, and, and the kind of uh, values I have about uh, college. Guild Executive, I love you guys. Uh, it's, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, every Thursday, it's, it's a riot. I mean, it's just fun. I, you might not think so, but I think uh, as grievance officer, it is a lot of fun. Okay, Distinguished Faculty Award Committee. Yes, uh, um, yes, you guys really just, you made this fun. You made this uh, less pressure. Uh, any pressure uh, that was here was on myself. And uh, my parents, my brother Phil sitting right there, my father, Chuck, my mother, Terry, and my brother Philip, yeah, he's sitting right there in black. Uh, my wife, my dear wife, Letty, she's right there in green. Okay, yes, yes. And my friend, my friend Teresa Vargas is here too. She's a great, great, great um, uh, primary ed teacher. Thank you so much, everybody.